I began to sob, sob uncontrollably on the side of the road. An old woman knelt down to comfort me and asked me what was wrong. I didn't even really know how to explain, so I just told her that I missed my friend. Despite my scepticism, I stuck to the programme for at least half a year and I kept going for my periodic visits to the clinic and it did jack shit. In fact, I got worse. I was always getting worse. One thing that particularly struck me about the ME support groups was the pure desperation and confusion. With most other conditions, you're given a diagnosis, a prognosis of whether it's going to kill you and what you can do to manage it or cure it. With ME, you don't get that. You get an indeterminately long sentence to purgatory. You feel worse than you've ever felt in your whole life and you're given no explanation as to why and no signpost pointing the way out. There was no selection bias to the people suffering. Members of the group were anything from esteemed ex-lawyers to single parents to former athletes. One thing I can say, these people were for the most part all extremely driven and collectively mourning their old lives. There's a stigma that because ME's predominant presentation of symptoms is tiredness, that its victims are just being lazy. I can tell you firsthand that me and every single person I've met with genuine ME would rather run a thousand marathons and have to live another week with the tiredness and the unrelenting fatigue. We were at war with our tiredness, trying desperately to escape it, and some of us would go to extreme lengths to turn ourselves into guinea pigs to try and find ways out. Suicide was pretty common in those online support groups. It was around this time I was swallowed into the music industry. I was out busking on the streets one day and I noticed this sketchy, good-looking Mauritian guy with his arms crossed watching me really intensely as though he was studying every lyric coming out of my mouth. He approached me and asked me if the songs I was singing were mine. I said they were. A big smile was painted across his face and he told me he just finished recording Plan B's latest record, which turned out to be The Defamation of Strickland Banks, one of my favourite albums of all time. He was looking for a new project to sink his teeth into and he asked me if I'd come to London to record. We got into it. The whole time I felt dreadful, but this was a lifelong dream materialising in front of my eyes. So bit by bit, when I could, I'd get the train to London and start chipping away at my first ever album. I didn't really let on how I was feeling during this time because I didn't want to sabotage it. There would be times I'd finish up in the vocal booth after doing the take, excuse myself to go to the toilet, throw up from the dizziness I was experiencing, sometimes with specks of blood, and then I'd go back and pretend that nothing had happened. I'd be sitting around with the whole room spinning and would pretend I was fine. There was only so long that I was able to keep this up. Eric told me it'd be a cool idea for me to start going to industry showcases and start building buzz. Performing live like this was a whole new level of taxing that I wasn't ready for, but I was so ferociously ambitious that I just ploughed through. The usual way it would go is I'd be in the back of Charlie's car, the whole world would be spinning, I'd be trying my best to sleep in it all day, parked up outside of whatever venue or pub it was in London, trying to conserve energy for the show. Sometimes I'd cry a little before I performed. My whole body would be burning. Then I'd brush it off and I'd get on stage and I'd perform as best I could. People would come up to me at the end, pat me on the back. I'd smile and pretend to be charismatic. Then I'd get back in the car and I wish I was in bed and have to endure a three-hour drive back to Bath from London. There was only a few shows where I could keep pretending. I'd usually be trying to disguise the fact that my body was trembling through the fatigue and pain. Eventually I started crying mid-set. It became blindingly obvious to everyone working with me during that time that something was very wrong. I told Eric that I needed to take some time out. My plan was to live at home with my mum for a month maximum, get my energy back and come and finish the record. That one month turned into two months, turned into three months, turned into six months. I pushed myself to total burnout. The distance led to me and that angel breaking up, in part because it was difficult to navigate a relationship when you have so much brain fog and I didn't know what... It was well enough to be able to explain it to her at the time. With a loud thud, I'd been jolted out of a Shakespearean storyline. I'd lost the record deal and I couldn't get out of bed. My friends from Trick the Fox never really called to check up on me. It felt like the whole world was moving at lightning speed without me. I had this amazing opportunity right in front of me and I was chained to the floor. I was alone. I was sick. I wished that my condition would get it over with and kill me, but it wouldn't. And it felt cruel that it wouldn't. It just let me rot in bed. The whole world would continue to turn and I would rot. In the next episode, I'm going to tell you about a fight with a television and losing my anal virginity to an 80-year-old man. Stay tuned for that. Ciao. <laughs>